So thank you very much for taking some time to join us today for our National Nursing Week webinar. My name is Terry Belcourt. I'm a registered nurse and nursing practice advisor here at the SRNA. And I'm so pleased to be joined by two members here in the SRNA office in Regina, uh, Candace Hennepin and Dre Irwin. And they're gonna share with us some of the unique roles that they are contributing to nursing in, in different ways. Um, but it is nursing and it is just an exciting piece. We're also joined by Emery Wolf, who is providing some technical support for us today. So thank you, Emery. Uh, just before we get started, if you haven't joined one of our webinars before, you can interact with us best by asking questions um, through either the chat forum or through our question and answer module. And we will make sure that Candy and uh, Dre see those questions and, and answer them. So we might well get started. Mm -hmm. So um, Candy, do you want to tell us just a little bit about what you do in nursing and what is, uh, what is exciting about that? Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Nurses Week. It's pretty exciting to have a week designated to nursing. So I'm happy that um, I have the opportunity here to talk about some of the things that I've done in nursing. Um, I've been a nurse for 43 years now, so I've done lots of very interesting and exciting things. Um, but uh, my most recent uh, exciting venture has been uh, doing some mission work. I've had the opportunity to go to Guatemala, Pat Soon, Guatemala, twice now for two years in a row. Um, so last February, I went to Pats in Guatemala for a couple of weeks and did mission work. And then again, I had the opportunity this past February uh, to go back to Guatemala and do some mission work. So it's been very, very exciting. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Dre, tell us about you. And for those of you who are watching, you're going to see that uh, it looks like Candy is doing all the speaking. It's because we're working off of one sound system, um, but we are taking turns uh, speaking, of course. So sure. go ahead, Jeff. Okay, well, thanks for having me. My name is Dre Irwin. I'm originally from Regina. Um, basically, a little bit about myself is that I was in the Canadian Armed Forces for three years, and uh, just to sh make a long story short, had a live fire exercise and almost killed someone. Their fault, of course, but you know, for me, it was the realization that I wanted to do more with my life, and I realized that I'd rather save lives than take them away. So I got into nursing, and I worked at the Pasco ICU for a few years, and I worked in Moose Jaw, did home care, worked out in a lot of places, and then I um, I started working up in Pine House, and I've been doing that for about twelve years casually, and. Uh, Took a full-time position about a year and a half ago, and now that's what I do. And so I work in Pine House. It's a, it's a small little rural community about 800 kilometers from Regina, um, about 1,500 people. And I function as a primary care nurse with aid or additional authorized practice. Yeah, so that's a new designation here at, here at yes. the SRNA. So the first time we've had an RN with additional authorized practice be part of our webinar. So oh, thank awesome. you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, about that piece? How that, did you go through the prior learning and recognition process? I did. Or the, yeah. I did. So I went through the PLARS process. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, you know, it's funny because at the time, like, because I was employed there for about 12 years, we followed the FINEP guidelines, right? So it's a bit different than it is now. We were a little hesitant with some of these changes, thinking, you know, things are going well. Why are they changing? But, you know, this, the CDTs and the AAP license has been probably one of the most rewarding and um, satisfying things for all of us in the north to do it really it really changes the way that we look at what we do because we follow these clinical decision tools and these clinical decision tools are based on these limited common medical diagnoses that we're allowed to assess diagnose treat and evaluate so what it does is it creates a standardization for care in the north so you know anybody in the north that's being seen by rnaap is being treated and seen the same way mm -hmm. so it's actually very rewarding and you know we we really actually most of the times 
don't even have to consult a physician or nurse practitioner because what, when we see clients in the community, and most of the time it's walk-in, so they'll come in for, you name it, you know, cough, cold, chest infection, ear infection. If it's within those CDTs, we can, we can treat if that's what's appropriate because there's all those things with your assessment, your evaluation, your differentials, um, your non-pharmacological options, your pharmacological options, and then your evaluation. So within those CDTs, if, if the treatment fits, basically, then, then we're okay to, to do that without consulting a physician. Mm -hmm. And then it gives those, those guidelines so that, you know, if there's something that we're just not too sure of, then we make that phone call to the physician in Larange and go from there. Right. So it, it's awesome. We, we love it. Good. Yep. Oh, that's exciting to hear. I think that uh, working in the small, smaller northern communities is something that not a lot of nurses know a lot about mm -hmm. and how that works, especially when there isn't a physician there right away. So, so that's really, really it, great. It is really different. Like, you know, you, you know, when I first started working up there, I actually was working in ICU at the Pasqua. So it was a big change for me because in working at the Pasqua, you've got pharmacists, you've got physicians, you've got other nurses, you've got a really good support team to help you. And a lot of the time, most of these decisions for patient treatment is based from the physician. Now you go to rural north and next thing you know it they're telling you okay someone's got you know so and so and they're in the room right now go it's like well you know at first it was very intimidating right so that's where a lot of that experience and knowledge that you gain through experience is so important for working in the rural because you can't just really you know, it's difficult even with that experience to go up there to do those things because that's where really those assessment skills really come in handy. Like I'm going through those books all the time, right? Just to follow up, am I doing the right thing? And relearning those things, relearning those assessments. Um, so it's very important, but then all those other classes are very important too. Your pharmacological, pharmacy, your um, com uh, communities class, your, you know, all those classes that we thought, well, what the heck, why are we taking this? This is where it all comes to play and so all those classes every day you're taking that critical thinking that yes. you you learned in all those classes and you're applying it on a day-to-day -day basis so for us on a typical day like for us just to give you a little bit about pine house and and the clinic up there there's three rns that work with aap that work monday to friday eight to five and most of the time what we do is do walk-ins so people will just come in when they want and and be seen by one of the nurses and so it depends on why they come in. We don't know. Most of the times it's either skin infections or chest infections, upper respiratory tract infections. And so then we follow those CDTs. But something that's really important for our job too, it's obviously it's primary care. And what our focus is, is not just to have people come to the, the communities with a problem, but focus on giving them the tools that they need to advocate for their own health. What we really want to promote is healthy lifestyle, healthy education, healthy eating, health, you know, exercise, those kind of things. You know, for me, coming to the clinic would be talking about what options are working, talking about your diet, are you eating lean, green, and marine? Are you exercising? You know, how are you feeling mentally? All those things come into play. And for me, working in a community where you get to know everybody, like your family, is such an advantage than, you know, say some other maybe clinics where maybe they don't know the community as well. So when they come in with a cough or a, an infection, you don't just look at that one problem, you look at them holistically. And that really makes a huge mm -hmm. difference. You know, for me, especially just knowing that the people that, that come in, I, tip, I know usually quite well, I've developed that rapport with them. And so it's like treating a family member. So, you know, for me personally, I always try to go the extra mile. What else can I do for this person to prevent a problem? And so we also do other stuff with, we work liaisons because we are basically the front line when it comes to most of these people that come through those doors. We are those, the liaisons with physicians, uh, pharmacists and PA. We have an addictions worker. We have a social, social worker that we liaison with. Um, we also liaison with uh, people from the high school, the town council. Um, we do radio shows and we try to do that more often. I, I definitely 
have never really wanted to do those things when I was younger, but now I'm a little bit older, more experienced. I realize that, you know, it's important for the community to have someone to educate them because it's like a carpenter. You can't really build a house if you don't have those tools. So yeah. providing those community members with those tools. So yeah, it's very rewarding. It's an awesome Great. job. Oh, that's fantastic. And I really appreciate the comments about having to build that community, mm -hmm. right? Having to be a part of that community and, mm -hmm. and help them in however you can to, to bring out the best. Mm -hmm. So when I think about your work, Candy, and going into a community with the mission group, uh, how do you build those relationships? How do you, how do you get to that point where you get to be a part of you know, is there some work that's done ahead of time or how does, how does that work? Well, there is a lot of work that is done ahead of time. And in fact, um, when this particular group from Moose Jaw, uh, led by Jackie Wilson, a nurse from Moose Jaw, mm -hmm. when she had made the decision that she wanted to start doing some mission work, um, she had made contact and they were going to go to Africa. And then uh, that fell through and they actually managed to connect with someone, a fellow that lives in Guatemala. He's lived there for 17 years and he's from Regina. Mm -hmm. So he heard through the grapevine that there was a nurse in Moose Jaw that wanted to do some mission work. So he actually made contact with Jackie and said, we understand you can't go to Africa right now. Mm -hmm. uh, would you consider coming to Guatemala? So that was the initial step that was taken, and that was three years ago. Uh, that group that went down uh, was a group of seven people, uh, so a very, very small group. Uh, they did go to Patsoon, the same community that I've been to the last two years. Uh, Patsoon has about 18,000 people, um, and very, very, very poor. Um, I mean, they have no access to health care. Uh, the facility that we do go to is a clinic uh, run by uh, sisters. There are 12 nuns that run this clinic. Um, one of the nuns is a doctor, so she does do um, see people in the community. But most of the people that live in the community of Patsun and the area surrounding Patsun don't have vehicles. So uh, they walk to the clinic. Um, and again, they don't have finances to pay for the services, so it really makes it difficult for them. So the hot, there is a little hospital there. There are four ORs um, with very, very, very outdated equipment and machinery. Um, and then uh, there's 12 sisters. One of them is a doctor. And then they also uh, are attached to an orphanage. And there's roughly about 45 kids in the orphanage as well. So it's a very, very busy place to be. Uh, the hospital is called Corpus Christi. And that's the facility that, the, that um, we've been at now. I've been at two times and Jackie has taken a group there three times. So this past year uh, in February was the third time that we were down there. Um, last year, we uh, focused mainly on a surgical mission. So we took surgeons, anesthetists. Um, we have to take CSR staff because we have to have access to autoclaving and they have a little wee, very, very antique autoclaver. Uh, anesthetic machines are very, very old. Um, we actually have a fellow that comes with us uh, that lives in Guatemala, but is hired by the group. Uh, and he stays on site at the hospital in case some of the equipment breaks down um, because he can manage to rig up different things that will get us through. So last year we had three ORs going. We were very, very busy. Uh, we did approximately 40 surgeries in the five days that we were there. Um, and they were all successfully uh, discharged at the end of the five days, which is just great. Um, those Guatemalan people seem to be very tough uh, and they are so, so very grateful for, for the work that we do. This year, uh, last year the group uh, was 17 people. Um, this year there were 27 of us. We decided to expand the group and do some community work as well. So we had a surgical mission group and we had a medical mission group. So the medical mission, we actually went to four different, uh, very small villages around uh, Patsoon. And we, um, in the five days we were there, we went to four different villages and we saw 600 people. 
in those five days. So uh, we had very long days, um, but it was absolutely incredible. For me, these, these mission trips have been life-changing. Um, it's just been an amazing experience. So um, people come from all over, they walk, uh, they will be there in the morning at the hospital. You will have a lineup of people waiting to be seen, waiting to have surgeries. Um, the sister that is the physician, she will screen people prior to us going down there. And uh, we actually get a list of the names and the surgical procedures that are gonna take place before we get there. Uh, although uh, the day that we get there, of course, all of the patients on the list are seen by both the surgeon and the anesthetist to make sure that they are fit for surgery. Um, and uh, then the Monday, we arrive there Saturday, then the Monday we will start in the OR. And this past year, the Monday, we started to go out to the communities and the villages and, and uh, work with the pe people in the community. So it, it was awesome. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. So these roles that you are both in right now, is this something that you, when you first entered nursing, thought that you would be doing in your career? Well, for me, I always wanted to do mission work. Um, I don't know why. I always thought in my heart that someday I would like to do some mission work, but not realizing that it would ever come to be. Yeah. Um, but the time had to be right because you're going to countries that, you know, are somewhat unsafe. Some of the areas that we've been have been very, very unsafe. Um, so you have to feel comfortable and, and um, certain that, you know, your families are comfortable with you going to these places. Um, so it, it, it had to be right for me. And uh, when Jackie first approached me, I was working and um, I couldn't get the time off the first year, uh, but just made sure that if they were going again, she approached me and let me know that they were gonna go and plan another trip so that I had time to arrange to, to be off. So yeah, mission work has always been something that I've wanted to do. And now that I've done it, it's almost like you're, you're hooked and you're eager to go again. Um, we actually are registered with an organization that's called Bridges of Hope. Um, so we send it an application. And if they require nurses to go to other places in the world, if there's a need, then they will actually contact you and ask if you're interested in going. So I'm hoping that I will have an opportunity to go to other places and uh, do some more, more mission work because you do kind of get hooked on it. I guess not everybody does, but I certainly feel like I am excited to go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Like, you know, for me, it, for nursing, it's, um, there's an addictive part of nursing that, you know, when you help someone, you see that you really help someone, there's a, a good satisfaction to that. So that's, that's, I can understand where you're coming from. Uh, as for me, you know, it's hard to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a adrenaline junkie. So uh, I see you and emerge, you know, that's something that, you know, where I started out with that, um, that I really enjoyed. Um, and they're just got to point that, you know, and the beautiful thing about nursing is that if you want to change and move somewhere else and work somewhere else that you can, right? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm in a position now that uh, I'm very happy. I've, and I've taken some classes for my master's to get my nurse practitioner. But at this point in time, you know, the, the work that I do, uh, you know, like I said, if it's Monday to Friday to five at the clinic, we also do emergencies after hours so we're on call 24 hours after that 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 work that I do you know I can't I can't explain how satisfied I am with it you know there's nothing better than than helping someone and then being in a community that you you know who you know and being able to evaluate you know so often we do stuff and we don't know what the outcome is in the end right so here we we see them at the gas bar or the co-op and they come to you and tell you that you know they're feeling bad or they'll message you on Facebook. So it, there is a lot of satisfaction with the job. So yes, I'm very happy that I am where I am right now. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you, this is a second career for you. So, and now doing, <laughs> doing this aspect of it, um, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Nursing is so 
there's so many different options and so many different places and how even just changing the geography of the work can change the outcomes and change change how you're making a difference in people's lives so can you tell us a little bit about a little bit about your photography sure yeah, yeah. definitely so before I went to Pine House full time, um, I was actually going through a lot of personal turmoil and conflict and I've always been interested in photography, but I had a camera that I bought that I never used actually, just sat there and collected that. And so after when I was going through this pain, I remember seeing this old interesting barn out in the farmer's field by Tuxford and I thought it's one day that I was going to go out and go take a picture of this, this barn, you know. You know, so I went out there one one nice day and started taking pictures of it. And uh, then this the storm actually started to roll in. And I remember being out there, and one of the girls I worked with in ICU texted me and says, "Hey, Dre, there's this actually storm rolling in." She knew I was interested in that kind of stuff, and I'm like taking a selfie and with the storm in the background, saying, so, "You know, I'm actually you know here right now in the middle of a field." So, long story short, um, I ended up being caught up in a tornado oh and uh, actually feared for my life you know i and i was my truck was about 400 meters away um in the direction of this tornado and i remember thinking that you know i was too young to die and i remember thinking of visualizing myself being flown in the air and then drop kind of thing you know it was very scary you know i actually did really think i was going to die but i obviously survived um, and it was that storm that really has a lot of symbolism for me. You know, I look at the pain and I was going through and that storm and then the clearing of those skies, you know, for me, it really represents hope that, you know, that and courage that I, I can do it. You know, if you can just stick with things that even though the thing pain is temporary, you know, it might last a minute or a storm or an hour or even a year. You know, one thing I did realize, though, if I did give up, that it would last forever. So for me, uh, I took that opportunity um, and that to use that photography for myself as a way of coping with that pain. And so when I went up to Pine House, it didn't take long for me to realize that uh, I didn't. Ha I just had to look out my door and I would see the northern lights. And I didn't realize that when I went up there. So, uh, you know, it was, it was shocking and amazing at the same time, but it was shortly after that, a lot of the kids that saw my pictures came to me and asked me about taking these pictures with me. And, you know, at first I was kind of hesitant, but uh, shortly after they started coming out and then they started telling me that they had problems like addictions and depression, but photography was actually helping them. So I realized at that time that it will have addiction or um, photography can help me and photography can help them, then photography really can help anybody. Mm -hmm. And there, I remember nights, three in the morning last year, um, seeing like 14 year old girls crying, saying nobody loves me, um, saying their parents aren't around. And you know, it's so hard as a nurse to think, well, what else can I do? Mm -hmm. You know, so now we created this photography club and we, we've got a lot of the kids and a lot of the community members, and that's not just Pine House, it's all over actually, um, using photography. And what I try to teach them is that, you know, when you, when you look through the camera, you look for that perfect shot, you look for that beauty. And then when you start doing that regularly, then eventually what you do is you start looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Next thing you know, you're walking down the street and you're seeing a bud growing on a tree in spring and thinking that's a perfect shot or a sunset or a sunrise. And it changes the way you look at life, right? So you start seeing the beauty all around us because, you know, if you think about like a lot of the problems in any community, it's not just Pine House, a lot of it's based on the way we look at life, right? You know, we've all had bad things that happened to us, to me. Um, but it's about not focusing on those things, right? You focus on all that negative all the time. And I find that just leads to more negativity. You know, even though things have happened in the past, maybe that aren't as good for a lot of people, it's always good to practice looking at that beauty, looking at the positives, right? And so that's what we try to do. And it also gives these kids that focus you know so when you focus uh, through that camera it gives them that focus in, in everyday life too 
And, you know, all the kids have said the same thing, that it's like a big family. You know, it's a big family where we go together and we go take pictures and, and we support each other and, and then we help edit after. And so we look at ev even like other person's perspectives. So one person might take this picture, another person might take this picture. And then these kids realize that even though you might have one way of looking at that at the time, there's other people that might have had different perspectives. And even though yours might, one might not be better than the other, it just gives, teaches them that even though you think one way, doesn't mean it's right or wrong. There's other ways of looking at things too. So it, it's been very positive. Um, we've had a lot of positive outcomes, a lot of people that you know, haven't drank for months that are using photography now and inspiring. They're the ones now that are actually inspiring other people. They're getting thumbs up, they're getting, you know, increased self-esteem, they're selling pictures, you know, and it's not everybody's gonna be a photographer. You don't have to have a special camera. All you really need is a, is your phone to go out and take pictures. And it's a, it's a really good way to communicate in a safe way, non-verbally. Yeah. And these kids are connecting with nature, they're exercising, they're happy, they're laughing, you know, it's just a really positive thing for the community. So I'm very excited to see it even grow further, not just in Pine House, but hopefully all over the world. Yeah. The Guatemalan people love to get their pictures taken. And they're so photogenic. I mean, they're just beautiful. The kids, oh, they're just beautiful. And they love to get their picture taken. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe because, you know, they don't see cameras Ooh. and they don't see cell phones and those kind of things like we do here. But they really, really like getting their picture taken. Well, yeah. even some of these kids, too, now they've, they've done stuff like, they, and this is their idea after all this was to do a beauty pageant for some oh, of the wow. little kids. Mm -hmm. And their reason for behind, behind that was they wanted to help increase the kids' self-esteem, mm -hmm. right? So they see that this has helped them so much. Now, you know, um, it's, it is really satisfying, rewarding to see this because then you start changing other people's perceptions yes. too, right? Yeah. People see this and say, look, wow, look how far this person's got. Look how far this person's got. Maybe I can do that too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, yeah, it's amazing. Fantastic. Well, I'm just going to remind, we've got several people online here, that if you have questions for Dre or Candy, please do put them into the chat box or into the question and answer area, and uh, we'll bring those questions forward. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking uh, some more questions. That's great. Um, both, of what you're, both of you are doing such extraordinary things and making such a huge difference. Um, what do you think is the biggest impact that you've had with with these groups of people something that maybe wasn't out there before or um yeah just what well i think for when you're doing mission work whether it be guatemala or or any other country they are just so poor and they have absolutely no access we take everything for granted and they have no access to health care they don't have a vehicle to get to a hospital they don't um, you know, they just have nothing. They don't have the finances to buy medication like we do. When we went to the villages and the communities, there were a lot of people that we diagnosed with uh, diabetes. So um, we had to take, like we took 27 tubs of equipment. We have to take all of our equipment. We have to take all of our medications and all of our supplies for the surgical procedures. So mm -hmm. we take a lot of stuff. Uh, with us. So um, we would provide these patients with metformin or um, something to help. But when they're finished with the medication that we provided, will they be able to go and get more medication? And that's always the concern when we leave. Um, so as Dre said, we try to talk to them and we have uh, interpreters with us. So we have an interpreter with each physician that is in the community or at the hospital. We have interpreters. Um, but like Drew said, you try and talk to them about healthy lifestyles and what are they eating. And um, they all work with open fires. Uh, so they had presented with a lot of breathing problems, a lot of lung problems. And how do we fix that? So now as a group, we're thinking, okay, with fundraising, uh, maybe we can start providing some of these families with stoves. Um, and we're doing research on how we could do that in order to prevent 
you know, some of the health problems that we're seeing. So we're trying to, as a group, look at the big picture and say, okay, some of the things that we do are maybe just band-aid fixes for the time that we're there and maybe for an extended period of time. But uh, now being there for a few years in a row and seeing what kinds of issues that they're dealing with, health issues that they're dealing with, maybe we can look beyond that and say, okay, how can we help in other regards? Um, uh, I lost my train of thought, Terry. You asked me a question about the biggest impact. And I think that um, the biggest impact it's had on my life is, again, we are so, so, so blessed and we take things for granted. And I come back to Canada and you come home and you think, wow, I mean, we have everything that we could possibly need and certainly everything that we could possibly need in regards to healthcare. And yet we still complain. We still complain. And you just think about these people that have absolutely nothing and they're so gracious and they're so happy and they're so thankful. Uh, I don't know what they would think if they came to Canada and saw what we have, the houses we have. I mean, they live in shacks. They don't have running water. They don't have a stove to cook on. They don't have any of the things that we, every one of us have. And, and we do, you know, no one goes without those things in, in uh, Saskatchewan in Canada, not very often anyway. Yeah. But um, so it's, it's, it certainly gives you a different perspective on, and even a different perspective for me about nursing, uh, again, because we do take health care and, and the things that we have for granted. So even as a nurse, I've always been a very positive person and I've always been so passionate about nursing and I still am after all these years of nursing and I think how lucky I am to have had a career like that whereas at this point in my life I'm still very passionate about it and and now with teaching I try to share some of those stories and that passion with my students but yeah it's even had a, a huge impact on on my perspective in nursing and and thinking about the things that we have in this country and how blessed we are. So, and, the, and you, you never forget the faces that you see because they are so, so grateful and so thankful for just anything that you, you provide to them, a toothbrush, toothpaste. Um, we took um, uh, baby food with us, you know, formulas and just the powdered formulas because they would have access to none of that. And uh, they would use it for everything and anything, not just their children. Um, but uh, yeah, just to provide them with something. We made sure that every patient we saw in the community went home with something. Uh, we were given donations of skipping ropes, basketballs, and the kids were just, they'd never seen a skipping rope before. So, uh, you know, even to have the opportunity to, their, their faces are just priceless when you give them and show them how to skip. And uh, they've never seen anything like that. So we had fun with that perspective that as well. So yeah, it really, really has uh, had an impact on, on me, both personally and professionally, and, and has changed my perspective, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you, Joe? Well, yeah, that's a that's a it's a tough question, you know. Um, mm -hmm. What's the greatest, mm -hmm. really? Um, you know, I guess it's just helping people. You know, um, really, when it comes down to it, you know, and I I really like the words of Corio Soup. He's the, the the children's and kids and children's advocate for. He did that study with uh, in response to the suicides in the north. He, you know, and he said. Um, what these kids need is some people on a day-to-day -day basis to make an impact. They need parents, teachers, nurses to, to make an, an impact on these people and these kids on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So I find that that's kind of, I feel that role that I've kind of assumed, um, you know, in, in, with everybody else that's in the community, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, one of the greatest satisfaction, like I said, is just helping other people. It's a, sometimes it could be just seen like a minor thing, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think being there for a lot of these people and building that trusting relationship with a lot of these people is so important. Telling these people and showing these people that you actually do care about them. 
right? And it's it's true. Like I do, I, I care about all those people. And I always give them the opportunity to contact me if there's ever a concern. Mm -hmm. If they just have questions health related or they, they want to know if this is an emergency or not, or if they're feeling depressed. And we've had I've had, you know, people talk to me and tell me things that um, you know they probably wouldn't tell others and I, so it's 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 very rewarding that, to feel that people that feel that they can trust me that people can come in and talk to me you know and i you know and i really do miss it i've been back down uh in moose jaw for three weeks now and i really do miss it and i'm very much looking forward to going back up there and uh and and doing the stuff that i love to do and it's not like i said it's not just at the clinic uh, and it's being on call and being in the community as, as, a, as a peer, as a friend, as a counselor, as a nurse, you know, we wear many hats in Pine House as a nurse. Um, so there is a lot of, there is a lot of responsibility, but there is a lot of job satisfaction. Okay. Good. Well, thank you both. Do you have any other national nursing activities planned other than sharing your stories with us and and there's a few of us on but there'll be more that this will reach as we've recorded it and we'll share that through our website but anything else you have planned this week mm -hmm. to i don't have any other activities yeah. but i'm always excited about nurses week mm -hmm. and i always want to make sure that the word is out there that this is nurses week so thank a nurse that is taking care of you and and I appreciate what they've done just one comment um, that came to mind too terry was that when I think about going to Guatemala and I think about the fact that there were, like we set up these clinics in these old churches or these old buildings, we had our pharmacy set up and it was almost like a chicken coop. And you think, I always think that is what is a true nursing. You go there and they, they don't have policy and procedure books. They don't have anything that we have to follow in regards to guidelines. So I can go there and nurse and care for the people like Dre said that, you know, you can do the job that you were trained to do. So it's just absolutely wonderful to be able to have that opportunity to do that yeah. and, and help people uh, the way you were trained. So without the walls, without the hospitals, without the equipment, we go with very little, you know, stethoscopes and, you know, a few things. And yet we can, we can help and they appreciate it so much. But yeah, it's Nurses Week, so celebrate in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to be able to bring those standards and competencies all together absolutely. in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not doing really anything for this week for nursing week, except for getting <laughs> my house ready to sell, so <laughs> I can stay up in Pine House longer. Um, I guess the one thing I want to say is, you know, if anybody's ever interested in doing remote, uh, remote uh, rural nursing, um, you know, just a few other things that might interest people is that, you know, being up there, we, besides assessing and diagnosis and, and treating and evaluate, we also draw our own blood work. We also have a centrifuge and we spin our own blood work. We also do things like uh, suturing, uh, incisions and drainages, uh, emergency deliveries. Preferably they're not being delivered in Pine House, but we do sometimes occasionally have to deliver. Like I think I had to deliver one uh, last year on my birthday, four in the morning on someone's love seat. You know, and it all went well, and that's not ideal, obviously. But yeah. you know, there are a lot of things we we do do, right? Like I said, you know, we wear many hats, but it is a very exciting role. Uh, there is a lot of responsibility, but you know, the way I look at it is, every any RN can do what I do, and if there, I think you can just go to the SRNA website or SAS Polytech, and and then there's information about the courses that you're required to get to get your AAP. Yeah. So yeah, I encourage everybody to do it. There is, uh, it's very exciting. Or even contact myself if you have any questions about the job itself. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so we'll sign off for today. But thank you again both for being here and for sharing your stories. And I'm sure people will reach out to you both. And uh, just thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. And thank you, everyone. And thank for, you, for having us. Yeah. Oh, we were. Our pleasure. Um, so thank you for the attendees who logged in and stuck with us through, through the presentations.
If you do have questions, you can email them to links at srna.org and we can forward them on to Candy and Dre. So thank you again. We'll be live again next week. Um, we're talking about graduate nurse practice next week. So if you're interested in that topic, join us again on Wednesday at noon. So thanks and have a wonderful day and happy nursing week to everyone.